It is a wonderful pleasure to welcome you now for our eighth hearing meeting. For our eighth hearing meeting, which is very, very special, because for the very first time, the hearing meeting is incorporated in a conference. It's incorporated into the Austrian Academy winter meeting. And I'm not in Vienna this time. Uh, I'm in Oberlech in Austria at our winter meeting at the conference with about 50 additional participants. And I'm very, very happy to welcome all of you, all the participants internationally from all over the world and also from our conference center here in Oberlech in Austria in Vorarlberg. Welcome to the eighth hearing round table. It's unbelievable. It's already our eighth meeting. And this will have now a very, very special topic. So what, what is hearing actually? The hearing is an outstanding group of experts, an outstanding group of experts uh, which do otology implantation. We are now over 30 otology departments worldwide. You see here just a few of those. It is a global network from all continents. And Every three months, we do a special topic. And this time, we are really for hearing and structure preservation. The hearing group was founded in the year 2008. We do a lot of scientific reports and publication. And it's a special honor for me to lead this group now for five years since 2017. We are a very innovative group. So we introduce new surgical techniques, new drugs, new procedures. We try to educate people all over the world concerning audiology, implantation, and we should be and we are comprehensive and co-active together. Just some housekeeping things, please, during the session, which is recorded, because afterwards we want to bring this particular presentation, like all the other presentations, we want to bring this on YouTube and we will do so. So please quit all other programs for the best connections on your computer. Please mute your microphone. And this is very important. And additionally, uh, if possible, please name yourself uh, about organization and country. We are very, very interested where you are from. And if it's, it's an interactive meeting, if there are any questions or remarks, please raise your hand on the computer and we will discuss your topic and the meeting, as mentioned, will be recorded. This time, for the very first time in the hearing meetings, we will talk about structure preservation of the cochlear, of the inner ear, which is especially important in cochlear implantation. The moderation will be done by Professor Javier Gavilan from the University de La Paz in Madrid. And speakers, we have the famous professor, Dr. Shinichi Usami from the University of Matsumoto, North Japan. He's the pioneer of genetics in cochlear implantation and hearing. Then Professor Gunesh Rajan. He moved from Perth now to Switzerland. Then Professor Silke Helbig. She is now over 20 years in the field of electric acoustic stimulation. We must not forget electric acoustic stimulation was invented by Christoph from Ilberg in May. 1999, so 23 years ago, and she was with this program nearly at the very beginning, and she has a lot of experience. Very important, and it's a very special pleasure to have my colleague, Professor Mac Dillon from the University of Chapel Hill, the biggest cochlear implant center in the United States, and she has a lot of experience with a wonderful audiological team, and they really analyze all the patients. And please not to forget, since the very beginning, also now 25 years in the field, Professor Arthur Lawrence, a physicist from the Warsaw Group, from Warsaw, Poland, from the Kayetani World Hearing Center. And they have unbelievable believable experience with about 400 cochlear implantation every year. What is new this time, for the very first time at this eighth meeting, we have an international certificate, CME points. And please uh, do not forget, if you want to have the points for the CME certificate, to send an email to us 
and you will receive the points. And now, please, let us start the journey to Professor Xavier Gavilan, University of La Paz in Madrid, the Lord of the Richland Please enjoy the meeting. Thank you, Romy. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being here for an hour, uh, another round table from the hearing group. Hello, everyone, and thank you for being there on the other side of the screen. Even though we are slowly recovering in person activities, the hearing group uh, has decided to continue with our quarterly online roundtable program. And today, as has been mentioned by Professor Baumgartner, uh, under the exciting title of Structure Preservation, the whole experience, we want to deal with most aspects relating uh, to hearing and structure preservation. I mean, we will deal with genetics, we will deal with surgery, fitting, rehabilitation, outcomes, and as many uh, other uh, topics that can, can appear during the discussion. Over the next 90 minutes, uh, we will discuss the indications, the results, and the future implications of hearing and structure preservation. Not only for the well being of our patients today, but also for the sake of their future. We all would love to, love to make this roundtable a really interactive activity. Right now, there are more than 120 participants in, that, in this, in this roundtable. And we would love to make you free, make you feel free to ask and participate, sending us your questions, your comments. And you can use the chat, you can raise the hand, you can use the microphone, everything available through this Zoom connection. And to start with this interaction that we want to have with you during this round table, and to show you that we really want to be interactive, I want to ask you to take your cell phones, switch your camera, and we will ask a couple of questions to you. To answer, you either go to www.menti.com and enter the code that you have on your screen, 9892-4818, or you use the camera and scan the QR code to access the Mentimeter. The Mentimeter will, with the Mentimeter, will ask you two different questions. A, sing, a very simple one, just to have you um, feel comfortable with, with, the, with the system. And then we'll have a, a more important question for the development of this roundtable. So please go to www.menti.com, enter the eight digit number that you have on your screen, or it's much easier if you just scan with your cell phone the QR code. Now, if you are there, if you have already scan the code or enter Mentimeter, we want to ask you, what is your field of expertise? This is a very simple question. You can say your surgeons, your audiologists, hearing acousticians, uh, acoustician because there's only one, uh, speech language uh, pathologists, also, also one, two student, and maybe uh, some other things that we didn't consider during our, our preparation. Uh, but Please feel free to answer. You can take your time. We are uh, not so much pressed by time right now. You can, you can uh, answer the question. And just to prepare for the next question, which is the, the, will be the, the, the important one. Right now, we have uh, a more or less uh, similar numbers between audiologists and surgeons and others. Uh, it's uh, like half of, the, of this uh, uh, surgeon and, and audiologist. So let's move to the important question of the, of the uh, Mentimeter. You have here three audiograms. From left of the screen to right, you have number one, the number two, and number three. On the dark red uh, brown area, you have the audiogram of the patient. 
Imagine the patient has an audiogram fitting in the area, in the black area, dark area of audiogram one, two, or three. This is a sensory neural hearing loss. So no difference between air conduction and bone conduction. Both of them are within the uh, dark area of the audiogram. Now, the question is, which one of these three audiograms, may we see the question? Which one of these three audiograms is the one from a person who's candidate for combined electric acoustic stimulation in the same ear? So if you have a patient with audiogram one, two, or three, which one will you consider to be a candidate for electric acoustic stimulation, obviously, in the same ear? And it looks like you shouldn't be here because you all know the right answer. Uh, uh, most of you, well, all of you, we are half right now uh, 50 answers. And uh, with 50 person answering, uh, the results all go to audiogram number three. Okay, this is right. This is the, the right answer. The other two audiograms are not audiograms from, from candidates to electric acoustic stimulation. Patients with a residual hearing in the low frequencies and what has been called a ski slope uh, audiogram are those that are candidates for electric acoustic stimulation. And this is what we are going to deal today during this roundtable. So to start with the uh, real content of the roundtable, we want to make a short long trip to Japan, to Matsumoto. And we came to Matsumoto to meet Professor Shinichi Usami. Professor Usami was the professor and chairman of the Department of Otorhinolaryngology at Shinshu University School of Medicine between 1999 and 2020, when he became emeritus professor. He is currently professor at the Department of Hearing Implant Sciences, where he continues basic and clinical research in audiology and genetics. Professor Rusami is a world expert on genetics in hearing and hearing loss. He has published nearly 300 peer-reviewed papers in international journals, and our group, the hearing group, is really delighted to have Professor Usami as one of our distinguished members. A distinguished member. He will tell us about the importance of genetics in hearing preservation. Shinichi? Okay. Uh, thank you for your uh, kind introduction. And uh, I hope you enjoy trip to uh, Japan. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's midnight in Japan. <laughs> you cannot see the beautiful mountains around uh, the city. Uh, my topic for today is a genetic marker study and longer electrodes for ES cases. So my question is why longer electrodes? Answer is this. The reason is that hearing loss uh, for ES candidates uh, is more or less progressive uh, with almost all candidates for ES showing a progression of hearing loss around two dB per year. One uh, example is shown below. Uh, this patient uh, visited us at the age of 38 and uh, used hearing aids, uh, but due to uh, progressive hearing loss, C received uh, sequential ES at the age of 48 years old. Nevertheless, her hearing is currently uh, within the indication for a conventional uh, CI. So uh, even 
uh, with a 24 millimeter electrode. Uh, electric uh, uh, <clears throat> stimulation can cover all frequencies, but recent study indicated that uh, longer electrodes uh, offer better speech perception uh, compared with uh, shorter ones. If the hearing loss is predicted to be a progressive, a longer electrode is better. Um, the second question is, what, what is uh, etiology of ES patients? Uh, the majority of candidates have progressive hearing loss due to genetic factors. Uh, at, at least one half of patients are determined to have hearing loss of genetic etiology. And I think that the rest of them may also result from the involvement of unknown genes. At least uh, nine genes, including uh, CDH23, uh, 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 SBTG1, mitochondrial uh, 1555A2G, myosin 7A, Myosin 15A, SLC 26F4, uh, TMP RSS3, uh, CLDN14, uh, and LOX HD1 are known to be involved. Um, healing uh, loss uh, caused by these genes is known to be progressive. Uh, <clears throat> this uh, uh, slide shows uh, the average hearing for each age group. And you can see uh, <clears throat> all of these genes show progressive hearing loss. You uh, probably think that longer electrode uh, may affect uh, residual hearing. However, uh, based on our recent data, uh, there was no significant difference in the preservation rate of residual hearing. Uh, this is tw uh, flex 24, flex 28, flex soft. Um, <clears throat> the sp spiral ganglion exists up to uh, the apical turn, indicating that tonotopic pitch matching uh, for longer electrode is uh, theoretically more natural. So uh, you may have uh, this question, is genetic deafness so common? Answer is yes. We undertook a genetic marker study uh, performed by the hearing group. We received more than 500 samples from nine centers and perform next generation sequencing analysis and found various causative gene uh, in the CI or ES patients. Uh, this is a sample from Dr. Rajan uh, showing a TMP RSS3 gene mutations. Uh, it was reported that uh, TMP RSS3 gene mutations cause high frequency involve hearing loss and are a good candidate for ES. Um, you may not have experience with genetic testing, uh, but hearing loss in the majority of your ES patient uh, probably results from similar uh, genetic causes. Uh, therefore, even without genetic testing, I think you already understand the etiology of ES candidates and the natural cause of hearing loss. Uh, thank you uh, for your attention. This is my talk topic for today. Thank you very much, Shinichi. Let's let's start with the with the discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that we all? I mean, not, not just the experts uh, doing genetic studies, all mm. autologists, we should do genetic tests uh, <laughs> for patients with hearing loss? 
Yeah, uh, hopefully. I hope uh, uh, all of the uh, autologists uh, should know some of, some of the uh, genetic uh, theory. Uh, but uh, now uh, you can understand the uh, theology of the, the uh, ES candidates. Sorry, you can skip uh, genetic uh, testing if it's not available uh, in, in your clinic. But you, you should know the general concept and general etiology and what to do for, for these patients. Okay, we have a question from the audience. Uh, Professor Hagen, which is a member of this uh, hearing group also, wants to ask something. Rudolf? Yes, hello. Hello, uh, Shiniki. My question is, do you expect that after the insertion of a short electrode for hearing preservation and having a progressive hearing loss ending in a total deafness, you have always the possibility to change the electrode from a shorter one to a long one? Or are yes. there some candidates where you cannot change from a shorter one because there is some uh, soft tissue sheathing around the electrode. What's your opinion? I understood you that it is better even in, uh, in indication for EAS to start with a longer electrode, isn't it? Yeah, now uh, I, changed, uh, I changed my strategy uh, from a short, shorter one to longer one. But uh, the, we have uh, very many uh, patients with uh, uh, 24 millimeter electrode, uh, but uh, they their performance is very good. So uh, the the difference is very very small. But but uh, for example, um, uh, hearing uh, under noise condition, uh, the performance is better uh, for uh, ES with a longer one, a longer electrode. So I, now I uh, confirm that uh, the residual uh, hearing uh, with a longer electrode, uh, even with a longer one, uh, a residual hearing can be preserved. So uh, uh, during this uh, 10 years, um, my uh, strategy is a little bit changing. Can I, can I ask you something uh, to, to all of you concerning how counseling can be modified by what you said, Shinichi? You mentioned that the patients with EAS lose two dBs a year over the lifetime. Therefore, they end up or they may end up losing the preserved hearing. Do, do this knowledge impact your counseling to the patients, to the families? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I always tell uh, the, the patient that um, hearing uh, loss will be pro progressive, not, not unfortunately, uh, not, not, not stable. So uh, uh, tell them that let's think uh, the future uh, audiogram, not 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 the current one. So uh, uh, <clears throat> if they agree, uh, they accept to to use uh, longer electoral. Doctor Helby, do you have the same? Well, <laughs> we agree. I was going to ask you. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, I'm I'm fascinated by this genetic testing um, because. Most often, what do you have? You perhaps have a grip on older audiograms so you can see how fast is there a progression in this uh, individual present. Um, still, when we counsel, we must keep in mind, and in, in most cases, it's so that when you insert the electrode deeper, you will have a higher chance for hearing loss. So if you want to, take the advantage of EIS, and this is what we have, uh, what we present to the patients is then you have to tell them, we would advise not to go in too far now, 
still he has enough uh, low frequency hearing at the moment it's not down to 60 decibel or so and i know okay this will result in full electric stimulation um but then he will have the advantage afterwards and there's some advantage as i think we will hear <laughs> so what, what what's your what's your opinion okay shinichi go ahead uh yeah um uh, from my experience, most of them already experience their um, progression of hearing loss themselves. So it, um, they may uh, easily accept my uh, con uh, concept. If, uh, yeah. Yes, if, if they really have a progression and are heading down with a pure tone autogram, then I agree. Then we also would advise to go slightly deeper, right? Okay, let's let's give the word to another of our hearing members, uh, Professor Hager from Saudi Arabia. I think he wants to ask something. Rahman. Yeah, hi. I'm really. How are you? Uh, yes, hi. Good uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good morning for those uh, in the morning. Uh, thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity to ask uh, questions. Uh, one thing we notice here in Saudi Arabia that uh, the cochlear duct length is smaller than uh, many studies. And uh, we are wondering how common to see a similarity of cochlear duct lengths in those uh, congenital anomalies, uh, diseases. I mean, uh, with genetic kind of uh, mm. hearing loss. Uh, mm. We noticed that the right and left are also different in Saudi Arabia when we measure mm. the cochlear duct lengths. So we are thinking of those genetic disease to have also some kind of a feature of cochlear duct links different than the norms. So I'm, I'm wondering what is your uh, experience in that? Yeah, I um, uh, always check uh, cochlear duct lengths before uh, uh, CI surgery. And uh, some particular gene uh, named uh, SLC26A4, which cause uh, enlarged vestibular aqueduct. Uh, this particular gene uh, may cause uh, hypoplasia of the cochlear. So we can uh, uh, usually use uh, shorter uh, ones uh, for uh, that uh, particular uh, patient. So um, genetic testing tell, uh, also tell, uh, can tell uh, the, the hypoplasia uh, hypoplasia of the cochlear, as well as other uh, inner ear anomaly. So uh, genetic testing is very powerful, I think. Gunesh, do you measure the cochlear duct length uh, in all patients, some patients, in no patients? Yeah, nowadays, or since a few years, actually, we do, because obviously there's different, different duct lengths, you know, and, and you want to use the best possible electrode to provide the, the, the coverage, the appropriate coverage. And I think it, it's become routine in a lot of places and we, we do as well. And uh, um, I just wanted to add to the, the question before, you know, with regard to, you know, counseling with patients, right? I think it's, it's a very challenging question. And I think it, it also depends on the age. Because, you know, children with partial deafness, we had to look at differently than adults with partial deafness because there's very, you know, children, the, the, their hearing is more, you know, robust even after implantation. They have better hearing preservation rates after implantation and the progression seems to be different than in adults. So I think it, it is, uh, it, in the end, it's quite individual thing, but the genetics, as Shinichi beautifully showed, you know, it gives us a really good indicator as well, whether it's a you know, quickly progressive kind of hearing loss or it's a very slow progressive hearing loss. And that I think is very important for the counseling, especially in, in children. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. We will keep discussing this, but to be, to be fair with all panelists, uh, let's move now to the next one. And we are going from midnight in Japan to mid afternoon in Lucerne.
and we came to Lucerne to meet Professor Gunesh Rajan, which is uh, an outstanding specialist in otorhinolaryngology as well as neck and face surgery. He's the co-chief physician at the ENT clinic Lux of Lucerne. Uh, Gunesh was previously professor of otolaryngology and head and neck surgery at the medical school of the University of Western Australia in Perth. And I think he moved to Switzerland to um, achieve better body preservation because of the cold, because otherwise I don't understand the reason. Well, here he is delighted to have uh, Gunesh as one of our, our prominent members. And he will deal uh, today with the surgical experience on hearing preservation. Gunesh. Yeah, excited to be here and talk about the cochlear implant surgery for electroacoustic stimulation. Um, I just want to acknowledge the great group that's made it possible to, to um, do this, all this work. So, and which is uh, over the, developed over the last 10 years, basically. And uh, I want to share a few insights with regard to that. I think we've evolved uh, quite a bit. You know, initially we were talking about hearing restoration and then the concept you know, for, of cochlear implantation got augmented with the concept of trying to preserve residual hearing. And so we added hearing preservation you know, into the equation and then Later on, we realized, well, hang on, you know, the inner ear is not just the cochlea, it's also the, the labyrinth and the vestibule. So the vestibular system. So we added the concept of structure preservation as a whole into cochlear implantation to preserve the whole inner ear. And then obviously the question started, how do we you know, do that? And initially it was a bit, you know, we, we knew it worked, you know, and, uh, and uh, Professor Van Aylberg and Dr. Professor Leonard and, you know, showed us, you know, it is possible, you know, around 25 years ago. And then, but still, the, it was a bit the blind leading the blind. We didn't really know. But over the last two decades, we realized there's a few things we had to look out for. And I think uh, I would like to, you know, popularize the concept of, understanding what's happening, you know, in, in cochlear implantation. And this, this two hit concept of any ear injury in cochlear implantation is very, you know, helpful regard to that. The first hit is the trauma during the initial surgery. And there, there are various mechanisms. Most of them are related to the insertion mechanics. That means, you know, the changes we induce through surgery within the cochlea, especially the pressure changes, the forces we exert during surgery. And the second component, the second hit, are all these processes that occur once we've done the cochlear implantation. And then in the weeks, days, weeks, and months to follow, you know, all these inflammatory processes which stimulate potential loss of the residual hearing. And of course, in the ear function. So how do we tackle the first hit as surgeons? You know, I, I think it's very important to understand the insertion mechanics. And there, the crucial component is the insertion speed. We know nowadays, you know, that over time and several groups, including ours, have published that, that, you know, the slower you insert, the less trauma we cause. And, and I had feedback from several groups who started doing slow insertions, who, all, you know, who are able to demonstrate on one hand, more rate, higher rates of complete insertion, but also better, better preservation rates of hearing. The other component, which is very important is the experience of the surgeon, because, you know, we, with our hands, even though we are very experienced, there are limitations. And this is just to show you a graph where, you know, we have experienced surgeons and novice surgeons, and you can see the intracochlear pressure variation diverting quite significantly between an expert surgeon 
and the novice surgeon. Again, these intracochlear pressure changes are not good for you know the the inner ear of the for residual hearing. Another component is, which is very important is the array, the electrode array, the design of it. Because as you know, we the, we introduce with the electrode, we introduce a mass into a confined fluid filled space of the cochlea. So that means, you know, invariably we cause a lot of disruption by introducing this array. And these nice experiments from Inga Todd show you that on the upper left, that there's a, a lot of pressure change with, you know, perimodal array versus on your right lower hand, you know, a lateral wall, thin lateral wall electrode, which has a smaller volume. So I think that's something we also have to realize. How do we fight the second hit? How do we tackle those processes that, that occur after implantation? And I think one component which is crucial there are the steroids. And here is just to show you uh, uh, the effects of steroids as a hair cell protection, but also as a such spiral ganglion protection. And therefore it's become part of the standard armamentarium to try and minimize the second hit. This is just studies showing you what happens over time with the use of steroids and with regard to hearing preservation, which shows you a nice preservation even in patients with the you know, left corner audiogram. So with all these you know, knowledge and experience gained over the last 10 years, we sort of create a bit of a checklist uh, in, in order how to make surgery as less traumatic as possible in order to preserve you know, the function of the inner ear. And these are the various steps, and uh, we can. I'm happy to discuss it later on with the, uh, you know, with the, in, in part, as part of the discussion. But I would like to close at this stage. Thank you very much. You finish, Gunesh? Yep. Great. Uh, we we have some time for discussion. Uh, that that was a great presentation. I was going to ask you something. Uh, but you mentioned that uh, how slow is slow. You said two minutes, uh, but it, it, the idea is to put the electrode slowly all the way or stop, slow, stop, slow. How, how, what would you recommend? Very good point. Well, if you look at the experiments, you know, we did in the other, you know, the group, other groups, it's very important to do a continuous insertion to avoid the, the intracochlear pressure changes. So continue slow motion, and that's where obviously the limitations happen with regard to you know, the manual insertion, because we can't do a continuous insertion slow. And that's where the, you know, the various insertion devices come in, which are currently being developed. Okay, Professor Hagen again wants to ask you something. Yeah, short question. Do you still use short electrodes or do you also switch to longer ones like uh, Shinichi? Thank you, Rudolf. Yeah, I've also over the years, over the last decades, we have switched, especially in adults, where there's a clear progression over the years, we have switched uh, to, uh, to the longer electrodes. And, and Gunesh, do you think that we should do the same approach that you mentioned in your last slide, all the steps of, of EAS surgery, we should do that only for patients when we want to preserve hearing, or as you were mentioning before, moving to structure preservation, we should do every single cochlear implant like this. Yeah, very good question. The, I think you should do it for every implant case because you wanna preserve the structure, no matter how much hearing is left in that inner ear. That's one, you know, with regard to preserving the structure for future treatments. We don't know what's gonna happen, you know, whether there's regenerative treatment or whatever, but they, they all need a substrate in the inner ear. 
So it's really crucial to preserve that. The other thing is you have to realize it's a team effort to get the best results. So if you do every case like it is a true implant case, if it's a once, even if it's a left corner audiogram, the whole team, the scrub team is used to the technique and the environment and the setup, which is so important to achieve good hearing preservation, because then when it counts, you know, it'll be an anti-climax and everyone's used to doing it. So I think I would recommend doing it in every case. I totally agree with you. I, I, I don't think that anything in the world can be done well if you do it just once in a while. The only way to do it well is do it uh, as a routine. We have right now, Gunesh, we have uh, more than 140 uh, attendants uh, to this uh, round table. And I'm sure some of them are not uh, convinced of the need to do a hearing preservation approach. How can you convince them? Gee, it's a philosophical question, isn't it? <laughs> Imagine no, it's, it's me, it is me the one who doesn't believe on that. Yes. Why? So I think there's several factors. For the patients, we know that the, the impact of residual hearing is, has many benefits. And I'm sure, you know, Meg, Meg and Silke and Arthur can talk about the you know, audiologic benefits. It, it's not additive, it's exponential, exponential actually, the benefits they gain in various hearing dimensions. You know, it, be it the spatial acuity, be it music, whatever. So this purely from the patient's perspective now with regard to the hearing performance, there's a lot of benefits of preserving hearing. Then again, with regard to future treatments, that's what we alluded to earlier. It's very important to preserve the hearing because we have a substrate when, you know, when stem cell therapy or any other regenerative treatment comes in, that we have some viable tissue in, in the inner ear. So I think these are sort of the, the, the key arguments in, in my opinion, but I'm sure the, the others will have, you know, can substantiate that even, even more precisely than me. Meg, Professor Dillon, uh, say something about that. Convince yeah, I, the, the, the unconvincible. Yeah, I, you know, from some of the, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, some of the data that we have about the effectiveness of different mapping procedures, I think we're underestimating what these patients can achieve with the combination of acoustic and electric stimulation in the same ear, um, particularly if they have um, acoustic hearing in the contralateral ear. So I think there are some, we know we see the benefits, like was said, on localization, speech recognition, and challenging noise situations. You know, we can talk to patients about that. Um, and that is poor if they're listening with electric stimulation alone. So um, having a little bit of acoustic hearing added to electric stimulation adds a big benefit. But one of the things that we're seeing is there's a lot of variability in outcomes. And part of that variability could be due to the way we're programming the device. So I think we're going to find there's a larger benefit than what we know of right now. Great. Uh, we have a last question from Professor Hagen. Punish, uh, concerning structure preservation, is there still an indication to perform a cochleostomy? I think uh, not really. I mean, I can't remember when the last time I did a cochleostomy. Um, and unless it's a complex malformation and, you know, but in a routine cochlear implantation with the appropriate imaging, I think you should be able to foresee the, the odd case where you still have to do the cochleostomy. That's the surgical mind thinking. But also from the structure preservation point of view, we know that when you drill open the cochlea, you induce these processes inside the cochlea, which lead to you know, all this inflammation, you know, Akira Ishiyama's work has beautifully shown what happens once you drill into the cochlea and violate the endosteum of the cochlea. So I think, you know, with all these elements gathering these puzzle stones, I think the, the, the cochleostomy is really only an approach in, in, in very unusual situations or very difficult access situations. Okay, we have uh, another question from uh, the ENT Symposium in, in uh, Lech, but we are going to move first to the next speaker, just to be fair with all speakers. 
And then I promise I will uh, take the question from, from the audience in, in the Austrian meeting. So let's uh, move from Austria to Frankfurt. Okay, in Frankfurt, we have Dr. Silke Helbig. Uh, she has been working at the Frankfurt ENT University Hospital since 1997. And she's currently the senior physician of the otorhinolaryngology department, as well as head of the hearing center. One of her main areas of interest is hearing preservation in cochlear implantation, where she is a worldwide known expert. Dr. Helbig is also on the board of the Foundation for the Promotion of Hearing and Speech in Friedberg. And we are, as hearing group, truly glad to have you, Silke, among our panelists during this roundtable. And I think you will tell us about term results with hearing preservation. Yes, thank you very much for the introduction. And I can tell you it's an honor to present in front of all of you. So within the next minutes, I'm going to talk about hearing preservation in the context of CI treatment. And since this is a lifelong process for the patients, it's also a long-term observation. First of all, we should think about what factors can cause the loss of residual hearing. And we heard that already today, damage to structure within the cochlear must certainly be mentioned. Since the loss of residual hearing we can measure is the clinical indicator for injury to intracochlear fragile structures. This can, when it happens, usually be verified directly after surgery. But, and we also heard that, there are also inflammatory processes which can go on and which can cause a hearing loss, then also in a progressive course. And as we have just heard, there are also genetic components that can gradually lead to hearing loss. So now let's focus on the part that surgeons can influence, namely structure preservation. And what factors are decisive for this? On the one hand, there is the anatomical structure itself, namely the cochlea. And Professor Rask Andersen's research group has very nicely demonstrated, you see that on the left side here, that the cochlea is not one size fits all, but that the length of the cochlear duct can vary significantly. You see that on the right side. However, an altered shape or pathologies of the cochlea can also complicate our surgery. For example, otosclerosis or intercochlear schwannoma and prevent us from hearing preservation. Beside the anatomy, there is the material used important. So for this purpose of hearing preservation surgery, very flexible electrode arrays of different lengths are available nowadays. You see some of them here on the left side, where I listed them. Nowadays, lateral wall electrodes have become the preferred choice when we want to preserve residual hearing. And what also became obvious over time is that a deeper insertion inherits a greater risk for damage within the cochlea. And you can anticipate that when you take a look at the histologic images at the right side. So now let's have a look at hearing preservation during CI treatment. And we published a study on this a few years ago that included 103 ears. And all of these 96 patients had residual hearing within the low frequencies. And we measured uh, their residual hearing by calculating a um, pure tone average of the frequencies at 125 hertz, 250 and 500 hertz. And after CI surgery, the preservation was described and the course over time up to 11 years was investigated. 
When you take a look on the left side, you will see that after surgery, we result in a significant hearing decrease, a fact that is and was also reported uh, by other researchers. Uh, but within the first year after treatment, this hearing remained stable. However, in the long-term follow-up, there it uh, uh, revealed a further reduction of the residual hearing and this was quite interesting so we had a closer look at a group of patients who kept their residual hearing afterwards and we saw that they worsened slowly by 1.5 decibel per year another interesting point was the rate of complete hearing preservation and it was quite remarkable that in the long term, it was 21%, and this was lower than the rate we had immediately postoperatively, which was about 8%. And this is a number that is also consistent with the scientific literature. However, more recent evaluations show lower rates for complete hearing loss over time. And why this is the case could already be suggested by this diagram. In fact, if you look at the new generation of electrodes here presented in green bars compared to the older ones used in early days of EIS, like for example, the M electrode or the standard electrode, you see less cases with complete hearing loss. Thus, it is expected that better data will be presented in the future, also in the long-term observations. I thank you very much for your attention and will be happy to answer your questions. Before starting the discussion, uh, just let me move a little bit further from where you are and let's take a trip to Warsaw. The idea was to meet Professor Arthur Lawrence, uh, which is a professor and head of the Department of Auditory Implant and Perception of World Hearing Center at the Institute of Physiology and Pathology of Hearing in Warsaw in Poland. And he, was, he has received the first uh, award from the Minister of Health and Social Welfare for outstanding achievements in healthcare. Uh, professor Lawrence is well known in the cochlear implant world and we are very happy to have uh, Arthur in our group. And I wanted him to be here uh, just to start the discussion uh, with you. Uh, my, my, my first question to Silke will be, and, and then I will move to, to Austria. Don, I, I didn't forget you. Uh, my first question was, is there a difference from what I heard from Shinichi Ushan, Usami about 2 dBs per year and your long-term results? Do, you, you don't have this same uh, idea of, of uh, losing hearing progressively? No, I don't think so. I think that resembles the fact that we must keep in mind these patients will still lose some more of their hearing. Still, 1.5, 2 decibel is not that much to my point of view that we may not give EIS a try. Because if you start very, very good, perhaps with 10 decibel at 1 or 25 hertz, uh, then 30, 50, such as ski slope hearing loss, who's very good in the low frequency, then you can still use EAS for a long time. Okay, uh, Austria, are you ready for the question there? You Todd, can you hear me? Yes. I'm sitting here in the meeting room from a wonderful meeting in Lech, Austria. And I have a question to uh, Gunesh, Gunesh Stock. You have been talking about uh, insertion speed and pressure changes inside the Scala tympani. Do you think that, for instance, uh, machine-assisted surgery would help to perform gentle insertion like roboter-assisted surgery? Would the roboter be 
able to more gentle and more structure preservating uh, insertion uh, compared to the surgeon's hand? Yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah, absolutely, I think so, because the insertion devices, you know, there's quite a few, as you, meant, you mentioned, the robot taller or the eye motion, Yoker eye motion or whatever. Uh, the, the aim is always to have a continuous slow, slow insertion. And uh, that I think we'll probably in the years to come, we'll see even more insertion devices, which will help us to, to, to achieve that. Because we know, you know, we did some experiments where we did compare the three, milli, three minute insertion to a 30 minute insertion automated. And it was quite obvious that in the 30 minute ultra long insertion, the, this, there was no pressure change, basically. So I think uh, that, that that is clearly a clear signal that you know we we need such devices. Thank you very much. There's, there's a question in the in the chat uh, asking if it could be useful to create a discharge discharge cochleostomy. I understand, like uh, another window to allow the uh, compensation of the high pressure uh, during insertion. I, I never think about that, but uh, this is a question there. I, I think it must come from a stapy surgeon. <laughs> it, well, I think it comes from one of my guys in, in La Paz. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we, we, there's a technique described that in stapy. So, uh, a good question, good thinking, I agree with regard to intercochlear pressures, but I think we can overcome that by making the, the opening of the round window membrane large enough so that the perilymph can escape as you're inserting the, the array. But a uh, good point. Okay, uh, Professor Baumgartner. Yes, Gunesh, I have a question for you also for maybe the other panelists. Uh, in Bern, uh, four years ago, the first robotic surgery was done. And so far with the HERO robot actually, we only have the simple, the easy part of surgery, we just have the outside, but the most important, the most dangerous target is the insertion itself. And so I think, what is your opinion? Because in my opinion, we rather should try a robotic insertion at the particular insertion intracochlearly itself and not so much on the outside. On the outside, everything is simple. If you have a bigger or a smaller hole, it's not that important. But the cochleostomy or the round window insertion in the scalar tympani, this is the important part. What, what is your opinion or from the others in that? Yeah, I agree. I mean, the approach, we probably, you know, the approach can be done surgically, the standard procedure, right, as you said, but the challenging bit is the insertion. And uh, that feeds into the other question of the insertion devices, you know, which, which will be useful for that specifically. <laughs> Simke, one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, can you summarize what factors are those that mostly influence long-term results in EAS? So first, the first thing I think is that you manage directly to achieve hearing preservation. So because then uh, you, you did your job together with the material used, what follows then is, as we heard, the possibility for inflammation, which you try to cope with by putting in steroids and the person's individual progression. This is something you can try to yeah, take your guess beforehand, but which will be the big uh, question for the next months and years, of course. Yeah. Hey, Arthur. Uh... Okay, if, if, if hearing deteriorates over time, obviously the, the perception of the user of the frequencies changes and you will need a new fitting and they need time to adjust to the new fitting. Is there any strategy to shorten the adaptation process with, uh, without frequent, frequent uh, frequency adjustment? Uh, yes, it's uh, quite critical to have uh, the follow-up uh, because um, if we can uh, adjust uh, uh, for the small changes, 
uh, and uh, do this um, in a, a repetitive way, uh, it is uh, much better for the patients. We present one study when a patient actually didn't come for uh, five years and it was a, a big gap between uh, acoustic and electric um, hearing uh, as the uh, acoustic uh, hearing deteriorates. So when we try to reprogram uh, uh, speech processor and provide low frequency uh, by electric stimulation, we of course change the uh, allocation of the electrodes uh, and make uh, a distortion immediately uh, in the way that even a patient had a problem to control uh, her own voice. Uh, so uh, the small uh, steps are the answer uh, how to uh, how to manage uh, this type of um, refitting in okay. case of a progressive uh, hearing loss in uh, uh, in low frequencies. Okay, we have to keep our journey, and we move from midnight in Japan to mid afternoon in Europe. And I see Meg smiling because there is early morning. Let's move to Chapel Hill. Okay, in Chapel Hill, we have Professor Dillon. Meg is an associate professor and director of cochlear implant clinical research in the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her research focuses mainly on new indications for cochlear implantation and individualized mapping procedures for cochlear implants. And especially electric acoustic stimulation devices. Uh, the hearing group is very lucky to have Meg uh, with us. Please, Professor Dillon, tell us about hearing preservation fitting. So this yeah. is one of my um, Go ahead. <laughs> favorite topics. Um, good morning from North Carolina. I think everybody's been seeing me pound the coffee, but um, this is one of, as I said, one of my favorite topics. So thrilled to be a part of this and super energized anyway, just to talk about cochlear implants and the fitting of electric acoustic stimulation. Um, so what I was going to share first is the way that we currently fit um, these devices and then propose an alternative that could help these patients hear better with the combination of these technologies. So right now with the default EAS mapping procedure, the goal is to provide the listener with the full speech spectrum. Um, but we are also wanting to account for the acoustic hearing that's there. And so we are delivering a portion of the signal acoustically and a portion of the signal electrically. And the way that we do this is we look at the unaided audiogram. And so here this patient is implanted in the left ear and we identify the region of functional acoustic hearing. And for the Medel system, um, that is 65 dB or better. And so that's replicated or represented in the blue shaded region. And so that will be fit for the acoustic component. And then we find that frequency that's the highest frequency of acoustic stimulation. And we define that as the low frequency filter for the electric stimulation. And by doing this, we are providing the listener with the full speech spectrum, just splitting it in two between acoustic and electric stimulation. But in doing this, we are not accounting for the variation across listeners of where the electrode is relative to the cochlear place frequency. So we've talked about using short arrays, using long arrays. So now we've introduced a lot of variability. We also have differences in our cochlear morphology, differences in surgical approach, and that creates this wide variability in angular insertion depth. And that's not being accounted for in the default fitting method. And that's depicted here. So we have um, an electrode array that is inserted into the cochlea. And I have at each of these points where the cochlear place or what the cochlear place frequency is. And so in this case, if this is the patient's unaided audiogram, we've identified that region of functional acoustic hearing. So now represented in blue here. And what we're doing is saying, all right, 313 is where that crossover is. So I'm gonna put 313 in this electrode contact. But now I've created this 
shift in what I am presenting and where I am presenting it to. And we know that listeners of conventional cochlear implants need some time to get used to these differences um, or what we refer to as frequency to place mismatches between what we are delivering electrically and the cochlear place frequency. And now we know that we can have um, cochlear implant recipients with long electrode arrays. And so it could be that we have electrode contacts that are within the region of functional acoustic hearing. And by providing stimulation, we could be masking the benefits of that acoustic low frequency hearing. So the physician and the surgeon could have spent a lot of effort to try to preserve that hearing. And now I'm delivering electric stimulation into that region and masking all the benefits of the acoustic um, stimulation. Of, of, yes, of the low frequency acoustic stimulation. In addition to that, by not incorporating where the electrode is, I'm still presenting 313 on this electrode, but I still have a mismatch. So in this particular case, we have two issues. We have frequency to place mismatch and we have electric on acoustic masking. So what we've been doing at UNC is what we've referred to as a place-based mapping procedure. And we're fitting the acoustic component the same way. And so we're verifying that against NAL and L1 targets, um, which is typical for the way that we fit um, hearing aids and the acoustic component for electric acoustic stimulation users. But instead of using the unaided hearing to define what the electric filters are, we are using the post-operative CT scan to determine the angular insertion depth of each of the individual contacts. And then we can estimate what the cochlear place frequency is. We then align what we consider to be the critical speech frequency information, which it, we define as low to mid frequency information with the cochlear place frequency. So eliminating elect or frequency to place mismatches. Um, and so again, this is how that might look. So this is with the default procedure where we could have basal shifts in the stimulation or apical shifts in the stimulation um, in addition to electric on acoustic masking. For this case of a shallow um, angular ins insertion depth, what we would do is again, fit the acoustic component the same way, but now for each of these um, electric filters, I'm aligning it to match to the cochlear place frequency. And we think that this should help patients hear better faster. Um, but in doing this, we are creating a gap and the frequency information that we are providing. Um, and historically what we have seen is that if there is this frequency information gap that EAS users perform poorly. But what has been shown more recently in EAS simulation studies is that listeners can actually tolerate a gap in frequency information as long as the electric stimulation is matching the cochlear place frequency. Um, for the case of a deep angular insertion depth, what we are doing is the same thing, identifying the cochlear place frequency, aligning those filters to match so that they don't have these frequency to place mismatches. But for these contacts that are identified to be within the region of acoustic hearing, we're turning the stimulation level below detection so that we are not masking the acoustic hearing. And some of our early work is showing that there is a benefit, at least acutely. And so this is the work from our simulation study. We are also conducting this in a randomized prospective evaluation. Um, but what we are seeing here is percent correct for sentences presented in noise. And then we have the signal to noise ratio on this axis. And these are for listeners that have been randomized to the default or the place-based map. And what you can see is overall that there is better performance with the place-based map um, particularly at these more favorable signal to noise ratios than there are for the listeners that are having to acclimate to some of these spectral shifts in information. So we think that this is a promising way to approach mapping and move forward into individualized fitting methods for EAS users. Thank you very much. Thank you, Meg. And now uh, we will move to the discussion of this last presentation. And that will be our last uh, round of discussion. So please, uh, ask your questions. Uh, Arthur, you want to say something? I, yes, first, first of all, I'd like to co congratulate Mike. It was uh, so beautiful presented. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we, of course, uh, have very similar ex experience in terms uh, of this discussion where we actually uh, are in the cochlea. We, we also consider this uh, as a critical for the fitting. We, uh, published the paper about the electrode estimation in the acoustic region. And actually there is a tool 
uh, in the uh, hearing web uh, website that you can uh, actually download the Excel sheet and uh, see how many electrodes are in the uh, acoustic region. So there is a decision to switch it off uh, if we want, don't want to produce the overlap and we also have the information how we are far away um, if we are uh, having a shorter electrode. So uh, this is a, a very easy tool to, to use. Uh, you need only to put the type of the electrode, the audiogram uh, and the uh, estimated uh, depth uh, of uh, insertion from the CT and uh, you can see uh, how uh, far you are in the electric, uh, in the acoustic region. Professor Hagen. Rudolf? No, she's not there. She wanted, he wanted to ask something. I, I will make, I will ask you a very difficult question. Okay. I'm a surgeon. I know nothing about uh, fitting. So can you make it clear to me what's the difference uh, between place-based place uh, fitting and mapping and anatomy-based fitting? So they're the same idea of incorporating where you are in the cochlea and aligning to cochlear place. Um, it's just the rules of the method are a little bit different. And so um, we do not have anatomy-based fitting approved in the, in the US, um, but from what my understanding of it is, and so please correct me um, if I'm wrong for those that are using it routinely, is that the filters are aligned to cochlear place in what we would consider to be the critical speech frequency region, which is your mid frequency. So 1,000 to 3,000 Hertz is where the bulk of the speech information is. And so they are aligning to place in that region and then allowing for some spectral shifts in the low and the high frequency region. Um, we think that it's also important to align in the low frequency region um, because we think that we might be better representing low frequency timing cues. And that in combination with the acoustic hearing could be contributing to some of the benefit that we're seeing with our EAS users. Okay, we have the question from Professor Hagen again. Are you there? Yes, uh, I, was okay. not I, I, I was not allowed to unmute, <laughs> but now it works. <laughs> <laughs> so you were the, the, the hacker of the system? No, no. <laughs> but maybe there was suspicion. <laughs> but it was not, no German music. <laughs> so my Go question, ahead, uh, our audiologist Anja Kurz is gathering more and more information on this anatomically based fitting. But indeed, there are some patients who are in favor on this anatomically based treating and others do not. So can you explain why there is uh, not a general uh, thing in all these uh, different fitting rules? Patients who are really in favor, they say after anatomically based treating, now it sounds more natural because the stimulation place corresponds to the uh, normal uh, natural space in the, in the cochlea and in others with the standard uh, uh, application, they, they, they stay with their fitting and do not want to have this change. Have you similar experience? Yeah, so I would say with um, the with our place based mapping procedure, we have not been seeing that it, it really is this preference for the sound quality early on. Um, we test them with both acutely and there are those that say that the place based sounds more natural than the default, but again the default is shifting across the frequency range. What I would speculate is that the listeners that have the anatomy based map um that are not reporting this naturalness of sound quality early on it could be that they are trying to adjust to the spectral shifts in the low and the high frequency region while benefiting from the alignment in the mid so we know that that's an issue that conventional cochlear implant patients have that they're acclimating right it sounds odd early on and it's because they're acclimating to these spectral shifts so it could be that those and again this is speculation but those that have the anatomy based map that are not um, reporting this improvement of sound quality early on are trying to acclimate to some of those shifts thank you meg i, I see our surgeons very active in questioning uh, gunesh yes A question from me to meg and, and arthur actually um, you know, the, the challenge I find in the team is, you know, dealing with patients you know, who have a certain amount of residual hearing. Let's say you have 
50, 100 patients with similar amount of residual hearing. And the challenge to me looks frequently is that, is that uh, they pull different degrees of or quantity of information out of their residual hearing. So even though they all have a similar threshold, but what they get out of their residual hearing is, is very varying. So how do you, you know, as an audiologist, how can you compensate for that? How do you find out you know, which patient with how much residual hearing? Uh, how do you adapt your fitting strategy to that? So I would say we're now um, prioritizing the acoustic um, fitting more than what we were before. Um, I, I think there, there's a couple of different aspects to, to, your, to your question. So one is we don't really know how much acoustic hearing someone has to have in order to benefit. We have some patients that just have acoustic hearing at 125 and it's 65 dB. And so you're thinking, do you add it? Do you not? And there are some that have a huge benefit. There are others that do not. And then there are others that do not show a benefit, but really prefer the sound quality. So it could just be the test that we're using to assess benefit. I think when you're talking about patients that have a certain amount of acoustic hearing and let's say, you know, moderate hearing loss out to five or 500 Hertz, right? Like they all have that, but we see that variability in performance. I think where that variability could be coming from in part with duration of hearing loss and aged implantation, is the differences in where we are representing the electric stimulation. Um, and if you're having to adjust to larger shifts relative to cochlear place, then that might you know, not show as large of a benefit when you're adding it to all that beautiful low frequency acoustic hearing than someone um, who has a closer alignment. Um, and so it could be that adjusting to these spectral shifts of electric information is more challenging for someone with a lot of acoustic hearing because that acoustic hearing is serving as an anchor to cochlear place. So it makes it more challenging to adjust to a shift that's being presented electrically for those patients. Okay, we have uh, Professor Baumgartner, but I have first a question from the chat. It's a rather technical question is, uh, Meg, how are you looking to apply the crossover frequency based on bandwidth with a given channel in the fitting software? Do you understand so, the question? Yes. So Lucky I think, you. Um, and Archer, I, if, Archer, I don't know if you have anatomy-based fitting, so your answer will be a little bit different from mine. So with our place-based method, we are very aggressive with where that low frequency is. So if we have someone who has a shallow angular insertion depth, and let's say that electrode is sitting around 800 hertz, but the acoustic hearing is only going up to 250 hertz. Our method would say you're going to have a gap between 250 and 800 hertz. Um, and what we're seeing with some of our early data is that listeners can acclimate or do well with that as long as you are aligning that electric stimulation. So they can tolerate some drop in um, um, frequency information that you're presenting. Um, now, that's not what's happening with the anatomy-based fitting, so that's why I'd like to hear what um, Artur's thoughts are on that. Y yes, but um, just uh, I think that uh, now it's a good moment to actually uh, refer to the first talk uh, of Professor Osami, because the perfect, uh, uh, perfect situation would be that we don't have uh, uh, mismatch and uh, also we don't have this uh, gap. Uh, so the uh, deeper insertion in this um, uh, in this respect we actually would uh, un, uh, would uh, help us to um, eliminate uh, these problems because now we are just trying to find uh, uh, sort of a compromise uh, having a, a, a good place of stimulations avoiding the mismatch we can create a gap and I'm also a little bit afraid that some of our, uh, our a patient can actually have problem to tolerate this gap if this gap would be uh, too too big. So uh, so I think that uh, in this moment uh, uh, the postulate uh, to have um, secure deep insertion with hearing preservation, uh, uh, I think that Mac agree with me is a postulate from the audiologist because uh, this uh, will help us uh, to uh, have a correct 
place of stimulation and avoiding the gap between electric and acoustic. Okay, we have time for one last short question, Baumi. I just want to go back for surgery. We certainly will have some surgeons in the audience and we do we have a consensus for, for triamcinolone or cortisol for the ARS procedure itself? Because we, we could not launch a general paper in between us because each hearing center, uh, every single one out of those 30 centers has an own strategy. So we use, we use triamcinolone, as you know, Gunesh, they do it maybe a day earlier. Some do it intravenously a day prior surgery. Some do it intravenously when surgery starts. Some fade it out two, three days postoperatively. So we have maybe in 30 centers, 30 different approaches concerning uh, dexamethasone or triamcinolone or whatever. Um, do we have some consensus if we have starters with electric acoustic stimulation? So maybe Gunish, would you like to answer or I don't want to give the answer by myself. A, sh a short answer, Gunesh, because we're uh, almost out of time. Yeah, well, there's no consensus there. I think the important you have to come from the other way around. What are we trying to achieve? Are we trying to, you know, reduce the impact of the trauma during the first hit and avoid the processes of the second hit? Then certainly we know steroids can have an effect. In what form and how to distribute? I agree. There is there's a lot of controversy. I mean, and I think that's that's really hard to find you know, a, a uniform approach, because there's also different types of steroids, so. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, Baumi, I think that doctors, when we don't know how to treat something, we give steroids, and this is one <laughs> of the reasons why we're doing 30 different things in 30 different places, but uh, we should uh, work more on that to get a, a, an answer and consensus will be a difficult word to achieve. Well, ladies and gentlemen, after an hour and a half dealing with the idea of hearing and structure preservation, there are some ideas that come clear to my mind. Number one is that all surgeries should be performed using hearing preservation principles. No suction near the cochlea, a round window approach whenever possible, slow insertion of the electrode, steroids, who knows. Number two is that genetics play a very important role in the diagnosis and management of patients with residual hearing undergoing a cochlear implant. Number three is that preserved hearing may deteriorate and even disappear over time. This is important from the counseling standpoint. And this is important because we have to use a less traumatic electrode possible, a long, thin, flexible electrode offering a complete cochlear coverage should be considered. And the idea of complete cochlear coverage recovers importance if the hearing that has been preserved deteriorates. And finally, from the patient's standpoint, Hearing preservation is important today for their daily life. But if we look at the crystal ball and try to see the future, we will understand how important is the concept of structure preservation for the future. The more structures we preserve today, the more options will our patients have tomorrow. Thank you all for your attention and participation. And before finishing, just uh, let me uh, mention some practical issues. Uh, Professor Lawrence already mentioned that if you go to hearing.com website, you will find a hearing preservation calculator that has been proposed by the hearing members and has been published in the Acta Otolaryngologica uh, several years ago. You will find the counseling platform also, and you will find the EAS uh, fitting tool, which is uh, a tools that are available for everyone in the in approaching the www.hearing.com. And uh, you can also find in the hearing.com, you can find a list of quality standards, tool for experts, profiles, and publications. And you have this 
learning platform, the Hearing Boost, where you can also get uh, a lot of information concerning all kinds of hearing implants. I want to remind you that uh, this roundtable can be accredited by the CPD standards. You can get international CPD points, all of you free uh, for the first 30, uh, and it will take up to six weeks to obtain that. So don't get nervous if you send us the request uh, to boost at hearing.com and we take some time to send you the certificate. And if you have any questions, doubts, inquiries, anything, you have our webpage here. You can find important things in this uh, webpage. There's a TED talk from one of the co-workers of Professor Rajan. It's a very inspiring short TED talk that you can find if you approach uh, the, our webpage in the hearing.com. And concerning the next round tables, uh, this was the first of 2022. We will have one in June, one in September, and one in December. The next one will be on challenging cases. We hope to see you all here, September, June 30, 2022. Thank you very much for being there.